Good evening, and thank you all so much for joining this evening's webinar, which is sponsored by Agios Pharmaceuticals. My name is Alex Dubois, and I will be facilitating today's program. Today, we will be talking about pregnancy and family planning in PK deficiency. Today's program will not include any specific product discussion, and we cannot any address any questions about your own specific health care or specific treatments. These questions should be directed to your healthcare team. To get started, please make sure that you are in speaker view on the top right of your screen to best see the presenters. If you have questions for the speakers during the meeting, we encourage you to submit those by using the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Type in your question and submit it to Q&A Jacqueline. Click send and your question will be shared with the presenters. If you need any assistance during the presentation, please contact our tech support by the chat function or by calling 732-419-1230. And if you're dis and if you're disconnected from the webinar for any reason, you can re-enter the program using the same meeting URL you used to join. The UL URL was provided to you in the reminder email about the program. So thank you again at any time during today's program. If you have questions for the speakers, please submit them through the Q and A box. We will be addressing questions at the end of the presentation. We ex expect today's webinar to be about an hour and a half. The first hour will be with our speakers and the last half for the breakout rooms. And I'll describe that more towards the end of the program. I wanna thank our speakers for participating in this webinar. Dr. Ariel Langer is a hematologist specializing in managing patients with anemias and, and coordinating hem hematological and obstetric care. And we are also joined by three fantastic women Laura, Tamara, and Molly, all of whom are living with PK deficiency. Our speakers are being compensated by Agios Pharmaceuticals for their time with us today. And again, as a reminder, the information shared in this event is provided by Agios for educational purposes and is not intended as specific medical advice. We will not discuss information regarding specific treatments for medical or treatment related questions please talk to your healthcare team. And again, like I mentioned, the last part of this program will be reserved for our attendee breakout rooms where you will be able to connect with one another uh, virtually via camera and audio. Please note that the breakout sessions are completely voluntary and will not be recorded. More information to come when we get to that part of the program. Now, I would like to have each of our speakers introduce themselves. Dr. Langer, let's begin with you. Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Ariel Langer. I'm a hematologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. I'm the director of our thalassemia program, as well as the director of the Women's Bleeding and Clotting Disorders program. In these roles, I collaborate closely with my obstetrics and maternal fetal medicine colleagues, and our discussion today sits right in the overlap of my two areas of clinical, clinical expertise, hemolytic anemias and women's health. Terrific. Thanks so much. And now to Laura. Hi everyone, I'm Laura, 53 years old and I live in Baltimore, Maryland. I was diagnosed with spherocytic anemia as a baby and with PK deficiency when I was about 10 years old. Thanks and welcome, Laura. Tamara? Hi, I'm Tamara. I'm 54 years old and I live in Minnesota. My PK deficiency symptoms started at birth and I received a diagnosis when I was six years old. I'm the mother of an 18 year old boy and a 16 year old girl. Thank you. And finally, to Molly. Hi, I'm Molly. I'm 35 years old and I live in West Virginia. I was diagnosed with PK deficiency when I was nine months old after having symptoms since birth. I also have a younger brother who lives with PK deficiency as well. And my son is 18 months old. Thank you all again for being a part of this discussion. And at this time, I'll hand it over to Dr. Langer, who will get things started. Welcome again, everyone. Thank you for being part of today's discussion. I'd like to tell, begin the program by telling you a little bit about what to expect. Individuals and couples affected by PK deficiency or PKD often have concerns about building a family. These concerns may include the potential impact of pregnancy on a woman living with PK deficiency, how PKD might affect mother and baby during pregnancy itself, 
the chance of passing on PKD to a child, and the impact of PKD symptoms on a parent trying to raise a child. We're going to address all those topics and a bit more during today's, today's webinar. I will also share information about the medical considerations related to pregnancy, parenthood, and how those interact with PKD. I'll also share with you a little bit about the data we have on pregnancy outcomes in PKD from the PEAK Registry, which is a global longitudinal study of PK deficiency and its impact on people who live with it. And because family planning decisions in couples with PKD are so intricate and nuanced, we've invited Laura, Tamara, and Molly to tell you about their very personal de decisions that they made about whether and how to have children. Our goal with this webinar is to provide you with information and perspectives that will be helpful as you think about your own family planning choices. Now, as mentioned, I'd like to get into a little bit more detail about PKD and pregnancy. Overall, what you'll see is that pregnancy in women with P PKD is generally associated with good outcomes for both mother and child. However, PKD does increase the risk of some potential complications for mother and baby. Before I tell you about these, I want to point out that every woman is different in terms of both the severity of PKD, complications, and comorbidities, as well as personal preferences. Knowing that, you should speak to your own care team about how pregnancy could affect you as an individual and a potential baby. I advise parents to meet, uh, excuse me, patients who are considering becoming parents to meet with their hematologist and a high-risk obstetrician, which is also called a maternal fetal medicine specialist or MFM. The best time to do this is before becoming pregnant so you can make informed choices. And if opting to pursue pregnancy, plan ahead on how to minimize your risks. We'll hear, hear some more examples of that from our guests tonight. Now I'm gonna outline a few of the complications that can happen during pregnancy in a woman with PK deficiency. It's important to understand that pregnancy increases the mother's blood volume by about 50% and also speeds up how fast her body clears out abnormal red blood cells. This contributes to a worsening of hemolysis, which is the breakdown of red blood cells, and hemolytic anemia, which is the type of anemia caused by PKD. Without proper treatment, anemia during pregnancy can raise the risk of premature birth, low birth weight, miscarriage, and hydrops fetalis, which is the buildup of fluid in the baby's organs. As a result, some, some pregnant women living with PK deficiency receive transfusions during pregnancy or shortly after delivery even when they don't typically need them when they're not pregnant. Transfusions, as many know, can raise the iron levels in the mother with PK deficiency. Iron overload is a risk for people living with PKD even when not pregnant, so it's really ideal to get your iron levels under control before you become pregnant. Later in our program, Molly will tell you a little bit about how, this, how she worked with her hematologist to manage her iron levels around conception. One consideration is that standard prenatal vitamins contain iron, so doctors typically recommend that women with PKD take prenatal vitamins that are specifically the ones without iron. But again, this is a general guidance, and you need to talk with your care team about prenatal supplements and all those details when you're ready to consider it. The risks of blood clots also go up in, in pregnancy for women in general, and especially for women with PKD. So if your hematologist is concerned about blood clots, they may prescribe a pregnancy-safe blood thinner. Pregnancy is also a stress on the heart, especially when anemia worsens, so it's important to make sure you've had a recent ultrasound of the heart before becoming pregnant. Sometimes you may be asked to see a cardiologist, but that isn't always necessary. PKD symptoms may worsen during pregnancy. Pregnant women have increased fatigue, jaundice, and scleroictris, which is the name of that yellowing of the eyes. I realize this may sound like a lot, but if you become pregnant, you can optimize your chances of having an uncomplicated pregnancy by receiving proactive multidisciplinary care from a high-risk obstetrician and your hematologist. It can also help you understand your individual risks and if pregnancy might not be the right choice for you. Now that I've mentioned a variety of, of potential complications, I want to remind you that I already said, and we'll go through some data showing, that the majority of women with PKD have successful pregnancies and healthy babies. This is one of the key findings of PEAK Registry, which is a lo global longitudinal study of patients with PKD. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at that data. So um, the PEAK Registry and the national... Um, uh, and the NHS were two surveys in which we were able to pull 58 women um, who had had a pregnancy. 10 of those women were actually postmenopausal at the time of the study, but they were able to reflect on prior pregnancies. You'll see here when we look at those 58 women, some of whom had multiple pregnancies, that about half of them are from North America and the majority of the rest are from Europe. So we should keep that in mind about where it applies, depending on where you're joining us from. 
Additionally, you can note that a little bit over a quarter of the patients were of Amish background, and that's important to note because it may influence the way people approach family planning and transfusion. Next slide, please. So when we look at transfusion characteristics of the women who went on to become pregnant, first, we're going to look here at what happened before pregnancy. You'll see here in both diagrams that there's a proportion of patients who are unknown, remembering that these are survey participants and it's pretty typical for not everyone to answer every question. But we know that the majority of women had been transfused at some point in their life prior to becoming pregnant. Additionally, when we look at what the pattern of transfusion was, we see here about 45% of folks were not being regularly transfused. So those were as needed with things like illness or symptom changes. However, um, almost 16% of women who did go on to become pregnant were on regular transfusion. And then again, we have a large proportion who didn't respond to the exact pattern of how they were transfused. Next slide, please. When we look at what happened during pregnancy itself, we see here that about half of women were able to get through pregnancy without a transfusion. About one in five didn't report whether or not they were transfused, and a third had at least one transfusion during pregnancy. There may have also been additional transfusions in the postpartum period, which is another time that women can often need transfusion because of blood loss at delivery. Next slide, please. But here's the data that you want to see the most and that we should go into in a little bit more detail. For the women who have been pregnant, the average number of pregnancies was two per woman. Additionally, while it's only for a small number of the births, for the seven births we have data, both the range of weights as well as the average weight was very normal and healthy. Finally, the part that's the most interesting for folks is what's on the right over here, looking at the actual pregnancy outcome. Again, we don't have information for every pregnancy, but for those that were reported, the most common outcome was a healthy full-term pregnancy. We see a miscarriage rate here of about 18% meaning a pregnancy loss in the first 20 weeks. That might sound like a lot, but actually as a hematologist, very familiar with the data behind pregnant, pregnancy loss, this is right in the middle of the range of expected pregnancy loss for all comers, for the general population. That might be surprising to folks, and I think that really reflects the fact that as a society, we don't talk a lot about pregnancy loss and some of those struggles, but just keep in mind, everybody listening to Nate knows multiple women who have had pregnancy losses, and so that's not necessarily related to PKD if that's happened to you. Finally, again, that preterm delivery rate that you see here at 10.5% is really comparable to the general population as well, meaning that it doesn't seem to have a worse outcome. Now, it is the case that in PKD, there's diminished fertility, so it may be more difficult to get pregnant. But once you're pregnant, what we can really take away from the peak registry data is that your likelihood of an outcome is really similar as long as you're in proactive care. Um, I think we can close the slides there. I know I've given you a lot of information to go through, a lot of data and a, a lot of details. So I think now we need to turn to Laura who can tell you about how she made her own family planning choices. Laura, you decided not to have children. Can you share with us how you ended up coming to that decision? Absolutely. My PK deficiency journey started at birth and I received a diagnosis of PK deficiency at around age 10. That means my diagnosis came over four decades ago when doctors knew much less about the condition than they know today. It also means that some of the decisions I had to make uh, or whether to have children or not to were based on a lack of information. Not necessarily that I would have made different choices, but looking back, I really wish I had more accurate information. I remember growing up hearing my parents say things like, Laura's probably not gonna have kids. I never questioned it. It was just something I heard and believed. Then during my teens and early 20s, I was under the, assum the assumption that because of PKD, I wouldn't be able to carry a baby to term or that I might even die if I got pregnant. This assumption came from comments from various doctors who knew little about PKD or being pregnant with PKD. At that point in my life, I didn't have a regular hematologist. I don't recall a doctor coming right out and definitively saying I wouldn't be able to have a baby or that I might not survive a pregnancy, but there was always a sense that it wouldn't be safe for me. I also assumed that PKD, or because of PKD, I wouldn't have the energy to care for a child. I used several types of birth control, but they wreaked havoc on me in terms of side effects. They, there just weren't many options for me. So around the age of 25, the idea of having my tube sides my tubes tied came up. 
my gynecologist, my PCP, and my family thought it was a good idea. And I wanted to do it because I was under the impression that if I got pregnant, I wouldn't survive. So I had the surgery done. It must have been very frightening for you to think that pregnancy could have been fatal for you. I'm going to ask Laura to share more of her story, but before I do, I'd like to briefly describe how I approach pregnancy conversations with my patients who live with PKD and other hereditary anemias. First, I don't assume whether or not my patients would like to get pregnant or have a child. I ask. Being direct can sometimes feel awkward and like I'm somebody's nosy auntie, but honestly, it's the only way that I can give people the opportunity to ask their questions and counter incorrect assumptions that they might have been offered in the past. Whether it's for hereditary anemias or other conditions in pregnancy, there's a lot of misinformation out there. It's rare for a woman to be high enough risk that I directly recommend against pregnancy, but how much risk you are comfortable with for yourself is really more of a personal preference than a cut and dry medical fact. Lots of people don't want to have kids regardless of health, so I don't want to assume that either. But it's important for me to be proactive in having these conversations also because diminished fertility is a consideration, especially for those with more severe anemia or a history of iron overload. And also because I need lead time to minimize the risks, as we'll come back to a little bit later in our conversation. For example, iron overload takes months or even a couple of years to address. So if I meet a patient at the time she wants to start trying, it's hard to do anything to change those risks. While it's helpful to have studies like the peak registry as a jumping off point, I always get into someone's individual risk and where they fall relative to these estimates. Sometimes it's clear that patients are meaningfully higher or lower risk than the average person in a study. So I try to use that type of data to set bounds on what is likely and take the conversation from there. So Laura, back to you. In addition to concerns about your own health, how did you feel about the possibility of having a child with PK deficiency? I was very concerned about passing along PKD. As a child, I had a lot of health problems like chronic infections and migraine headaches with temporary vision loss and such severe abdominal pain from gallstones that I had to have my gallbladder removed. I was in the hospital so often as a child that whenever I was admitted, the nurses would put up signs saying, welcome back, Laura. Um, Everybody knew me, right? During my late teens and early 20s, I was a much healthier version of myself, but still I had a strong sense that I wouldn't want to make a child go through what I'd gone through with PKD. I also didn't know if I would have the energy to care for a child who came with the same condition as I did. Even when I felt healthy, I was still very tired and I still struggled with PKD symptoms, you know, though it wasn't to the extent that I had when I was younger. And this weighed on me as a woman. My father was always very much part of my family's life, but occasionally I would see couples with children and notice that the woman did all the work. And I would think there's no way as someone with PKD, I would be able to do all of the work, especially for a child who had PKD. I work in a male dominated industry where there's little understanding or support for pregnant mothers or women. So my view, I would be a mother with PKD trying to raise a child with PKD while working full time. I wasn't making a lot of money in my 20s because of my PK deficiency symptoms, I had chosen not to go to college. So raising a child with PKD would be a financial burden as well as a disease burden. I just didn't think there was a way I would be able to do that. This is another example of me not having the proper information about PK deficiency. I thought that if I had a child, there would be a 100% chance I would pass PKD along to them. Laura, I'm truly sorry that you had to make such important fundamental decisions with incomplete or even frankly inaccurate information. What was your reaction when you learned more about pregnancy and PKD? I have a very clear memory of the moment I realized women with PKD could have successful pregnancies. It was in September of 2019 at the PK Deficiency Voice of the Patient meeting in Washington, D.C. I was one of the first ones to arrive at the meeting, so I sat down and just waited for the meeting to begin. Eventually, people started to arrive, and I watched them as they came in. Two things that shocked me as I saw so many was that I saw so many people with PKD. The first was that I wasn't the only one with PKD. I'd never seen anyone else with the condition before. And it was incredible to realize I wasn't alone. But the second thing I realized wasn't so positive that women with PKD can have children. 
I thought to myself, what, what, wait a minute, how is this possible? How did they have children? How did they survive their pregnancies? I was stunned and I was confused. You know, why hadn't anyone told me it was possible to have children? I was angry about it, um, not because I necessarily would have done anything different, but because the decision had been taken away from me, not on purpose, but by lack of knowledge. I really had to process the decision all over again and work my way through it to become secure in the belief that I made the right decision for myself. That sounds like a tremendously difficult experience, Laura. I'm really sorry that was the position you were in. I can only imagine starting that realization in a public place is an added complexity. You know, can you tell us what it was like for you to let go of the possibility of having biological children? And did you ever consider adoption as an alternative? So when I look back, I realized I never wanted children, but I do wonder, did I really not want them? Or did my brain just tell me I didn't want them because I believed I couldn't have them? And I will never know that answer. I, I struggle with it every now and again. As for adoption, I didn't consider it because even though with adoption, I wouldn't, I'm sorry, because <laughs> even through adoption, I wouldn't be able to you know, be pregnant and give birth. I would still have to raise a child. And even at my healthiest, my PKD symptoms still made me feel like I wouldn't have the energy to be a mother. Even though I made peace with remaining childless, there have been times when I've struggled with it. I sometimes felt sad as I observed their relationships my friends had with their children because I knew I would never have that. Even now, it still stings. I recently went to a wedding of my best friend's daughter, and I did feel sad for a minute knowing I would never have that experience. But the feeling went away. It, it always does. Fortunately, my brother and sister each have children, and I'm very close to them. I have two nieces and two nephews, and I have two grandnephews and a grandniece. I've always had my family's children in my life, which has been uh, extremely fulfilling for me. Overall, I feel like I made the right decision. I'm solid with my choice. I'm happy about it about 90% of the time, but there's the other 5%, you know, when occasions come up, like my friend's, you know, daughter getting married, that it kind of hits me sometimes. Well, Laura, thank you so much for sharing that. We really appreciate your openness on something that is a very personal and intimate subject. I hope that by sharing that today, you're also reducing the likelihood that any other woman will find yourself themselves in that position. Tamara, would you like to comment on what Laura has shared? Oh, you have to unmute. Thank you. Um, I think it's really mature of Laura to recognize that her doctor provided the advice he did out of misinformation and not malice. I mean, I, I felt the same way she felt at that event that we attended. And I did feel betrayed when I learned that there were other women with PKD who had children. But really, the decision that was made for her was based on the best available information at the time. Mm -hmm. I agree. It is very generous to take that lens and be able to understand how things could have gone differently. Laura mentioned in her story that one of her concerns was giving PKD to a child. At this point, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about how PKD passes from parent to child. As some of you know, PKD is a genetic disease caused by mutation in the PKLR gene. The PKLR gene tells the body to create an enzyme known as pyruvate kinase. In PK deficiency, a mutation in this gene reduces the body's ability to make enough of that pyruvate kinase enzyme. A deficiency in pyruvate kinase leads to the premature destruction of red blood cells, which causes the chronic hemolytic anemia. PKD is autosomal recessive. And for those who don't remember all of their high school biology genetics, that means that a child will develop the disease of PKD only if both parents pass down a PKLR mutation. A carrier is the term for someone who just has one copy of a mutation and doesn't have the disease. However, when both parents carry the PKLR mutation, a child doesn't necessarily have to develop PK deficiency. If both parents are carriers but don't have PK deficiency themselves, there's a one in four or 25% chance of having a child with PKD. If one parent has PKD and the other is a carrier, there's a 50% chance of having a child with PKD. 
If one parent has PKD and the other parent is not a carrier, there's no chance of having a child with PKD because an individual can carry the PKLR mutation without having PK deficiency. Genetic testing is the only way to know for sure if someone who doesn't have signs of PKD is a carrier. For patients with PKD or other autosomal recessive hereditary anemias, where you need two mutations to be affected, it can be really confusing at first. But the possibilities usually become quite straightforward if you have your partner tested. I'm used to having these conversations myself, though some patients also like to talk to a genetic counselor, especially if they're considering working with a fertility doctor where there's the possibility of testing embryos prior to implantation. I know on the whole, that was a lot of different possibilities and that genetics can be very complicated. So if you want to have a fuller understanding of your child's chance of inheriting PKD, ask your hematologist to go over it or set you up with a genetic counselor to have genetic testing, especially for your partner. With that, I'd like to turn back to Tamara uh, for our discussion. After deciding not to become pregnant because of concerns about PKD, Tamara, you chose to adopt two children. Can you tell us how you came to that decision? Sure. Um, so it's kind of a long story, but started basic. When I was 18 years old, my hematologist told me that even though I had all the equipment to become pregnant, and those were his exact words, I shouldn't have a baby. So basically he said that the anemia would be so taxing on me and my child that it would be unlikely that my child would live. And it was possible that I wouldn't survive either. And at that age, I just thought, okay, no big deal. I shouldn't get pregnant. And it really didn't upset me. And that's probably because I was only 18 and really wasn't interested in being a parent. And then, you know, just in general, growing up with a rare disease, I was always being told there were things that I should and shouldn't do. And so really, this was just another thing on the list. It wasn't a big deal. However, when I started dating, I did take a lot of precautions to make sure that I didn't get pregnant and that whoever I dated with the intent to marry knew that I wasn't going to have children. When I found my spouse, he was fine with it, and it really wasn't a problem. In the meantime, I had my spleen my removed, and the surgery didn't go well. I developed a clot, and I had five subsequent surgeries. There was quite a bit of scar tissue in my abdomen as a result, and that was really even more of a reason not to become pregnant. Again, I was fine with that. But then my nephew came along and wow, he like totally complete, uh, completely changed my mind about having kids. Spending time with me, with him, made me realize that I really wanted to be a mother. So my husband and I went to two different maternal fetal specialists and both of them advised me not to become pregnant. Both of them because of PK deficiency and because of the abdominal scarring. One of them told me that in terms of high-risk pregnancy, I would be the highest of the high risk. I was leaning toward taking the risk of getting pregnant anyway, but for my husband, it was a hard no. He absolutely did not want to jeopardize my health. It was more important for him that I be alive and healthy and that we have our marriage than for us to have biological children. So in our marriage, we basically have a rule that we both have to agree to doing something, on, especially in big decisions before moving forward. Um, we put our options on the table. We considered adoption. We considered remaining childless. Um, and in the end, he said that he would be happy with either choice. But for me, my nephew was the spoiler. I really wanted to have a family. So we decided to adopt. Thank you for sharing that, Tamara. It sounds like you also had an experience with a lot of information we now know is not as accurate in making your decision. Absolutely. Yeah. And well, when, how did the adoption process go for you? To be honest, it was difficult. Um, we entered a whole new world that we really didn't know very well and was kind of minimalized. Um, my husband is Hispanic. So initially we were going to adopt a Hispanic American child but that was a lot more difficult than it seemed. In the end, we decided to adopt from Ethiopia. So in Minneapolis, we have a large Ethiopian community and we felt that that would provide the child with some cultural affinity. Um, we are a transracial family. And even though that's somewhat compliment, complicated, it's also led to some really amazing and beautiful experiences. 
So for example, we've traveled to Ethiopia several times to visit my children's birth families, and we exchange letters with um, the families every year also. Can I ask what kind of impact, if any, did PKD have on the adoption process and on your ability to parent your children? Well, um, during the adoption process, I had to ask my doctor to write a note to indicate whether or not um, I would be able to parent. My doctor felt comfortable with that, so he did write the note. Um, because of the fatigue I experienced with PK deficiency, um, we purposely tried to avoid the infancy stage. So we adopted a daughter at 18 months old, and we adopted our son when he was six years old. But guess what? Um, older adopted children are almost like adopting infants in terms of their schedule and in terms of bonding and attachment. They really didn't sleep through the night for long because they were scared. They were just in a new place that they didn't know. So the parenting hack that I thought would help me bypass those sleepless infant nights backfired on me. Um, so for parenting in general, I do feel like PK deficiency affects me um, compared to other parents in the world. I think I've been a good parent, but when I think about how I want to show up for my children, I feel like I could have done better and been more present. For me, that um, means that I, I sleep a lot more than being with my kids and doing fun activities. Sometimes I just feel like I'm the most bearing, most boring mom in the world. So like I have to take a nap instead of doing something fun, like making monkey bread or doing a, a craft. Um, so while I'm not really good at all the fun stuff that makes memories, I don't have energy. I do feel like I might be good at some stuff. You know, Tamara, I think you're being way too hard on yourself, <laughs> but I'm going to resist the urge to get off my soapbox right now about self-compassion and parenting and really make sure we stay focused on you. Is there anything about living with a rare disease that you think might have made you a better parent? Absolutely. Absolutely. I do feel like I have a lot more empathy and patience than I would have had it if without PK deficiency. So both of my children have had a series of setbacks or developmental growth delays, and it's taken a lot of persistence and advocacy to navigate the medical system. My mom was a huge advocate for me navigating the you know, the medical system. And I, I learned a lot from her. Um, she taught me not to passively let things go. And I think I've been a really good advocate for my kids. Also, you know, with PKD, I do get brain fog and I've had to retire early from my job because of that. My son has a disability that affects his IQ. So we talk a lot about our disabilities and how brain fog can affect us. He does get down on himself but we talk about how we navigate through the world with that. And we try to look out for each other when we have brain lapses. I always tell my kids that all of us have something that we have to deal with. There's no shame in it. And we just help each other out. I think that's a really beautiful lesson to be children, teaching your children. Do you have any advice for other women and couples living with PKD who are thinking about adopting? Yeah, I mean, my first piece of advice is just to immerse yourself in the um, adoption world and learn everything you can about it because it's a total universe unto itself. I'm really glad that we joined adoption groups, transracial groups, book clubs, and went to a lot of adoption picnics and events, even though sometimes we didn't want to. Um, we discovered that we also had to learn about trauma. There's a lot of trauma in adoption and you know, the biological parents are basically placing their children for the adoption when they don't want to. And adoptive parents have lost that ability to have biological children. And of course, the children have absolutely no say in what's going on. Um, and then you do have to prioritize self-care. Whatever your PK deficiency treatment plan is, make sure you're optimizing it. Taking care of children is really rigorous for someone with PK deficiency. My husband used to travel a lot for work, like three, three weeks at a time, and it was really rough for me. I had a lot of depression in the early years because I, I really didn't have a life outside of taking care of kids. So I got depressed. I ended up in the emergency room because, well, I was basically suicidal. 
I think I had the equivalent of postpartum depression, which I did later learn affects adoptive parents. My doctor prescribed antidepressants and that helped. And as the kids got older, I got more sleep and more time to myself. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Tamara. I deeply appreciate your honesty. I'm sure that sharing your experience is really validating for a lot of other parents. As a reminder to everyone listening, if you're having suicidal thoughts or thinking about harming yourself, you can get help by calling or texting 988 to reach the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, which is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can also contact your doctor or call 911. Now I want to bring Molly into our conversation. Molly, before you we begin, did you want to comment on what Tamara has shared? Um, yeah, thank you. I just... Um... I really appreciate her openness and honesty because it really resonates with me. Um, currently, it's advised that I do not have another child, which is something I'll share in a bit. Um, but And that's something I'm still dealing with emotionally because I would love a second child. But your story just, I think it's so beautiful and it really opens my eyes to the possibility of adoption. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to you both. Molly, you gave birth to your son about 18 months ago, I believe. Can you tell us a little bit about the things you took into consideration as you explored the possibility of trying to become pregnant? Absolutely. Um, so hematologists told my parents that I would not be able to have children. Um, I wasn't in those conversations as a child. It, you know, as kids, that's not our primary focus. But my parents did relay that message to me when I got older. And it was really reinforced later in adulthood by my hematologists. Um because I'd been hearing it my whole life, I didn't really ever let myself want children. And I had time to adjust to the fact that children just would not be in the cards for me. Early on, I had told the man who became my husband that I wouldn't be able to have children and he was okay with it. Uh, but even so, the night before we got married, I, I remember distinctly, I called him and I was like, are you sure you wanna do this? Because <laughs> if you want out, get out now. Um, but he stayed and we've been married for seven and a half years now. And after about two years into our marriage, we decided to learn more about the risks um, if I were to become pregnant. And that's at that time, we went to see a hematologist for a consultation and he expressed concerns with the increased risk of need for blood transfusions during the pregnancy. Um, and because of the need for an increased risk or rate of transfusions, there would be a greater risk for iron overload, which increases the risk of iron storage in the heart and liver. And then for me, there was also the worry about clotting because I had already failed several blood thinners and I have a clotting issue secondary to PK deficiency. Um, so we decided to proceed with a preconceptive counseling visit with an MFM. And she said, if you were my daughter, I would absolutely advise you against pregnancy. You have way too many risks. So I was feeling pretty defeated at that point. So I would just put the, the idea of a baby in pregnancy out of my head for a while. Um, but about a year later, I had a conversation with my hematology specialist. Uh, I see two hematologists. They're both amazing. Can't rave enough. But one of them is my local doctor who just does my day-to-day -day care. And the other one who's a specialist um, who really specializes in PK deficiency and makes a lot of the recommendations for my day-to-day -day care. And his office is a few hours away, so I don't see him as often. But this appointment was with him. He didn't rule out pregnancy for me, but he did tell me about the risks. He laid everything out there for me and then said, you know, if this is a risk you want to take, these are the steps you need to, to take to get there. So after some long talks, my husband and I decided to start down the journey of having a baby. And what steps did your hematologist want you to take? Yeah, he said I needed to be very aggressive about my chelation therapy to get my iron as low as possible before trying to conceive. So for me, that meant receiving the maximum dose of an iron chelator that he knew worked for me seven days a week for several years. I also lined up an MFM specialist who specialized in blood disorders and OB care. Um, her office was uh, about two hours away from our house, but I wanted to be cared for by someone with the right expertise. In addition, my hematologist had me switch to a blood thinner that is approved for pregnancy. We also met a genetic counselor. Uh, my husband and I knew that it was really unlikely that he carried the gene for PK deficiency, but we also agreed that if he did, we wouldn't proceed with having a child. Um, 
you know, personally for us, we do not judge people that make a different decision. Um, you know, clearly my parents have having two children with PK deficiency. Um, I, as with, as a person with PK deficiency, live a very fulfilling life, but having a child with PK deficiency just wasn't a journey that we wanted to take. Um, so we did genetic testing, which was a little pricey because it was not covered by our insurance. And we found out that he does not carry the mutation. So finally, after we did all this and I got the go ahead for my hematologist, I had my IUD removed. Um, once I was fully cleared for my hematologist, we started to have unprotected sex and I actually got pregnant on the first try. So after four years of research and preparation, it was exciting and also beyond terrifying to be pregnant. I imagine it must've been a relief to conceive easily because we know that isn't everyone's experience. How did the pregnancy itself go? Yeah, there were a few bumps along the way. Um, to begin with, the maternal fetal medicine specialist that I had consulted with and done all this preparation work um, really dropped the ball in caring for me in the first 20 weeks of my pregnancy. As soon as I discovered I was pregnant, which was very early on, about three weeks, four days, uh, my first call was to the MFM to make an appointment to be seen. But the office staff said I should wait until I was 13 weeks along. I said, no, that's not right. I'm high risk. But they just would not budge. Um, so then at my 13 week appointment, I, they wouldn't schedule to have my hemoglobin checked, my ferritin checked, nothing that I needed. They also failed to send in prescriptions for gestational diabetes medications that I needed. So as a result, the first half of my pregnancy was beyond stressful. And then to make things even more complicated, my local hematologist who handles the day-to-day -day care, he actually retired and a new hematologist took his place. <laughs> so when the new hematologist learned about everything that I was going through and was having problems with the MFM, he immediately set me up with a new appointment and that was a huge relief. Um, the new MFM took care of my iron monitoring, the EKGs and everything. That office just, again, accolades. And at that point in my pregnancy, I was having transfusions about every seven to 10 days. Well, it sounds like it was quite a roller coaster despite your prep, but then you got settled. Women living with PKD are typically monitored very closely during pregnancy. As we've discussed, increased transfusion, iron overload, and blood clots are the biggest considerations, though not the only ones. Blood counts every one to two weeks is pretty typical with the initiation of transfusion or increase in transfusion if needed. Ferritin should be tracked to keep an eye on iron. Sometimes we're forced to restart iron chelation in the second half of pregnancy if levels are too high, though we never give them in the first trimester. Women who are not already on a blood thinner should talk to their hematologist about whether to start a prevention dose of blood thinner during pregnancy, especially if their spleen was previously removed because that can add to blood clot risks. You should know the signs of blood clots in the legs, which are persistent swelling and pain, as well as signs of blood clot in the lung, which is persistent chest pain or shortness of breath, so you, you're, you can help your team monitor. Of course, that can be complicated because those overlap with a lot of pregnancy symptoms. Depending on your other health conditions or complications, you may be recommended to have a cardiologist track your heart with ultrasound or be screened early for gestational diabetes. Finally, an MFM is going to monitor fetal growth with more frequent ultrasounds and some other tests. How frequent that will be will vary both based on maternal health as well as what the initial ultrasounds look like. Molly, what was monitoring like in the latter half of your pregnancy and did you experience any complications along the way? Um, I had ultrasounds at least once a month until the third trimester, and then I had them as often as twice a week. I also had really frequent non-stress tests later in my pregnancy to check on my son. Um, my care team was worried about intrauterine growth restriction, which is when the baby doesn't grow and develop as it should. Um, my care team was also concerned with my son not getting enough oxygen. My oxygen level tends to be low because of the PK deficiency, but that was even more of a concern when I got COVID during the pregnancy. And of course they monitored my iron very closely, but because it was so low before pregnancy, it stayed in a good range. I did develop gestational diabetes and had to inject myself with insulin, but I don't believe that had anything to do with the PK deficiency. I'm glad your care team was so conscientious with your monitoring. How were your PKD symptoms themselves during your pregnancy and how did your transfusion needs change? The shortness of breath is probably the thing that was the most notable because that was just horrible. 
Um, it was so hard to walk upstairs. And sometimes I had to sit, uh, sit straight up while sleeping because if I laid down my oxygen dropped too low and that wasn't good for my son. Um, I also experienced headaches, but the interesting thing is I really didn't have a lot of trouble with jaundice. As for transfusions, I stayed pretty consistent throughout my pregnancy, having them every seven to 10 days. And once I went about 14 days and then during the postpartum period, I needed a transfusion about every two weeks for about the first eight weeks. And can you speak to what your delivery was like? Yes. So the plan was to induce my labor at 39 weeks, but my son was big because of the gestational diabetes. So they actually induced me at 38 weeks. The early induction actually worked out in our favor because there was a small blood clot, blood clot found in my placenta. And if it had gotten larger, it could have blocked uh, the blood flow to my son. Um, but my labor, and I'm so grateful, was very easy. Um, so it was very short and our son Asher was born. My husband and I, I mean, just were over the moon when he arrived, but our joy quickly turned to worry. Asher had meconium aspiration, which is when the baby inhales stool into their lungs. Um, and it wasn't related to PK deficiency, but it really gave me an idea of the stress my parents had gone through when I was whisked to the NICU right after delivery. So after several years of preparation, it must have been thrilling. And then, as you shared, kind of scary to see some of the events. But how was your health after your son arrived and recovered from the aspiration? Yeah, after Asher's delivery, I stayed in the hospital for five days. I had lost a lot of blood, so my hemoglobin was low, my bilirubin and liver enzymes were high, and I ended up needing two transfusions in that first five days. During the months that followed, I developed infections that required four hospital stays during my son's first seven months of life. I had a uterine infection and several serious breast infections, and I don't think for sure that the infections were related to PK deficiency or the fact that it more so the fact that I don't have a spleen. Um, about a month after Asher was born, I had an MRI to check the iron levels in my organs. My heart was in good shape, but the iron levels in my liver had increased by five times what they were before pregnancy. This was something that was not a shock. We expected it because of all the transfusions. So my hematologist started me on my chelation therapy right away, and which is something that I couldn't do when I was pregnant. Sounds just unbelievably exhausting to have all those infections and setbacks that um, came at you during that period when you had a newborn. You didn't get them because of PKD, but you were at higher risk of getting very sick from not having a spleen, and that's just an additional stressor. Postpartum, there are several important considerations for women with hereditary anemias. First, blood loss is normal during any delivery, but it also increases the risk of needing transfusions. Um, as we just heard about, you had to have several right after delivery. And that can happen even if you don't need transfusion during pregnancy itself. The postpartum period is also the highest time, risk time for blood clots associated with pregnancy. So even though you think you're done with pregnancy complications, your body might not be. The six weeks after pregnancy are the most important time to consider being on a blood thinner if you aren't already. When to restart iron chelation can be complicated. As mentioned, sometimes we're forced to start during pregnancy when people aren't managed as proactively as Molly was, and it's too, it's, there's too much iron for it to be safe to wait. During later pregnancy and while breastfeeding, the only option is defraxamine, which is an in injection under the skin or IV only, not a pill. The iron chelators that are pills can't be used while breastfeeding. Sometimes that translates to stopping or not initiating breastfeeding. Women with hereditary anemias face all the same pressure to breastfeed that women in general do. And while there are upsides to breastfeeding that I really, really don't want to diminish, I'm pretty heavy handed in pointing out that carrying the pregnancy was an act of maternal devotion and dealing with a newborn and wearing a medication pump at the same time isn't something like anyone should feel like they have to do to be a good parent. I'm there to support, but I'm also one of my most important roles is to make sure that mom's health isn't devalued at that time where everyone's focused on the newborn. Getting iron back under control again quickly is vital if you want to consider another pregnancy or just staying healthy for, your, for yourself. Last, self-care can be really hard as a new parent and postpartum depression, which we've already talked a little bit about, does not get enough attention. All your doctors should be checking in with you about your mood. Fatigue and mood swings are normal, but hopelessness, depression, and suicidality are not normal and they are not your fault. They are medical conditions that deserve attention. 
your MFM or obstetrician and pediatrician are going to have the most experience dealing with this, but any doctor or nurse on your team should be able to connect you to the right resources. There's also the National 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline if you're having thoughts about harming yourself or anyone else. Having reviewed that, Molly, what has it been like for you as a mother with PKD to care for a little toddler? Um, it is it is the best and also one of the hardest things um, I've ever done. My husband and I took off for 12 weeks together after Asher was born. And having him home was the saving grace I needed, just especially with all the infections. Um, I also continue to have a lot of headaches and shortness of breath. Getting enough sleep is a challenge. And because Asher is not a good sleeper and he is terrible at napping, um, it makes it even more of a challenge. The brain fog from the lack of sleep is probably the most notable symptom for me. Um, but I also have some shortness of breath, joint pain, dizziness, and headaches. Fortunately for us, we have a ton of family support. So if I ever need that support, I can always drop Asher off with my parents or my husband's parents. And Molly, if you don't mind me asking, you alluded to this a little bit, but what are your thoughts about having another child? Um, I do not think we'll have another. Uh, my hematologist does not recommend it. And that is something, again, I'm still trying to deal with emotionally. Um, I would absolutely love another child and would love for Asher to have a sibling. Um, and I think if we do have another child at this point, it would have to be through fostering and adopting. But again, that's all right now for us in the back burner since Asher is so young. Well, thank you so much of sharing your, uh, for sharing your story with us, Molly. Laura, um, did you want to comment on anything that Molly has shared? Yes. Yeah. Um, Molly, you know, it's a relief to hear that even though you were initially advised against having children, you found a hematologist to work with you and recommend, you know, to you how to get through the pregnancy. You know, as we heard, Tamara and I did not have anyone who knew how to help us. Knowledge absolutely did not exist uh, at our time. You know, and you made a really brave decision, but the decision was yours to make. Yeah, I'm really grateful to all three of our guests. You each gave us a different, pers uh, different perspective on the question of whether and how to create a family. And you shared many intimate things and were really useful to other folks listening in. As I mentioned earlier, every individual living with PKD and other hereditary anemias is different and deserves individualized and expert care. If you have questions about pregnancy or any other issue related to PKD, please reach out to your care team. Great. Thank you so much to all of you for such a, a fantastic uh, conversation. Um, so important and, and obviously so authentic. So thank you. Um, before we provide you, um, our attendees, with the opportunity to break off into smaller groups and connect with others, we have five brief survey questions that we would appreciate you answering. Our goal with these programs is to provide content that is meaningful, uh, and we will use this information to inform future webinars. So we would greatly appreciate it if you could take a few minutes or just a minute to share your feedback to these five questions. And please note that all responses recorded will be anonymous. Just give you another minute. Awesome. All right, thanks again. Uh, as we prepare to move into the breakout rooms, we wanted to share a few resources provided by Agios for the PK deficiency community. If you could switch to the next slide. That includes the website, nopkdeficiency.com, the patient support group, My Agios, the No PK Deficiency YouTube channel, and lastly, the Just Listen podcast. These are all fantastic um, means of support, um, and we recommend that you log in or, uh, or listen to one of these. Thanks so much to everyone for joining this evening. If you enjoyed the webinar and would like to see others offered by Agios, you can visit nopkdeficiency.com slash patient programs. Thank you all for joining this evening and a special thank you to Dr. Langer, Laura, Molly, and Tamara for sharing their advice and experiences. We're thankful to all of them for taking the time um, and to sharing their information. This concludes today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.